from that. It is. Transplant. So now I think maybe maybe Pete is a a synthesized avatar. Yep. Why it's bound to happen be... sooner or later. Wasn't it? Well, I think I think having one Jordan is enough. We don't need to clone Jordan. <laughs> Who should we clone, Gil? Besides you, nobody else I can think of. Ted. Oh, aren't you sweet? <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating. I just said see view transcript and it showed up in the chat instead of the chat. Okay, oh. good. Fascinating. Oh, wow. I, Zoom keeps messing with stuff, including my brain. Um, hi, everybody. I thought your brain didn't play with Zoom. Uh, this one does. Oh, okay. Yeah, just, just the wet one. Just mm -hmm. the wet one. Um, how's 2023 treating everybody so far? Uh, soggy. Soggy, yeah. You haven't you haven't washed away, but you're wet. No, but uh, things around me have been pretty hairy. Man, uh, reservoirs are filling. Sort of a bright. They're spot. all at one hundred percent. They're all spilling in Marin. But, really? Yeah. Mount Shasta uh, was still one hundred and eleven feet low last. Oh yeah. When I checked, but I can tell you right now what it is. I found cool. this very I couldn't, cool I thing. I couldn't find a percent read on Shasta, so I'd love to know. <clears throat> yeah. Uh. Hold on one second. Thank you. Shasta is currently at uh, forty-four point two percent of capacity. Wow! And I will put this dashboard in the chat. It lets you look at all the major reservoirs in California all at once, or you can select, deselect, and then go one at a time. Um, gives it historical average where it was last year. Very, very cool stuff. Love that. Thank you. Engaging data, California Resort dashboard. Oh. Yeah. Um, so today is a topic um, session, and we didn't pick a topic in Mattermost yet. Uh, I suggested one. Another one came up yesterday, which I really like, which other people may not want to go into. But the one I suggested uh, with the invite was, hey, where is this shared memory? What does it look like to you? I just want to hear other people's thoughts, visions, perspectives on it, but um, you may not have uh, Peter, thought about I don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand what you mean, where is this shared memory? Which See, is, I, rest, I rest my case. Um, so what, what I mean, Gil, is um, if you tell me where's Wikipedia or what is Wikipedia, <clears throat> I can say it's a, a shared crowdsourced uh, encyclopedia. I can show you the code it runs on. I can yeah. tell you what servers it runs on. I can tell you I can show you who volunteered to fix it. I can tell you their business model, which is donations. And uh, like everything is quite explicit, quite open and quite picturable because it's an encyclopedia crowdsourced on a wiki. Cool. In trying to build some kind of shared memory for humans, uh, it turns out we're not all gonna use a wiki. Uh, much, much so that might be really interesting. Uh, we could start with a wiki and a wiki could certainly be part of it, but there's all these other interesting tools for thinking as kind of the umbrella thought of the category, cool. which don't talk to each other very well, uh, which are each interesting for different sorts of superpowers. And the blend of them and the joining of that information is what I'm sort of talking about as the shared memory. So, so it's not nearly as easy as Wikipedia, so, uh, so you're asking where where is the shared memory that we envision together, or uh, where, or where are all the pieces that may be part of this shared memory that we envision together? Is that what what, do we, what what do we see it as? What do we call it? How do we treat it going forward? In some sense, um, and it may be too abstract a, a question. Um, so we can so so that's one topic, and then yesterday on a call. Uh, a different topic, uh, which I really like and will separately be going into myself, which is how do you end conflicts well? Like, mm -hmm. what does that, what does it even mean to end a conflict? Well, uh, South Africa and Argentina tried truth and reconciliation commissions. I don't know how well they worked in South Africa, arguably not that well. Um, uh, and, and there's, I, I can give a whole bunch of small examples of, of uh, conflicts that ended well, ended poorly, and we're certainly facing right now Ukraine, Russia. And the question is, how could that end well? What would that even mean? Uh, and I sent an email to Mike Nelson, who is at the Carnegie Institute 
for international peace. And he wrote back and said, okay, I'll ask our democracy team and see what's up. Here's a couple links. So I, I haven't looked at those yet. That was in my morning emails right now. Uh, but that's a topic. And then floor is open for other uh, other topic suggestions as well. And it sounds like a couple, several, multiple people need to leave us at the top of the hour or early. So we will, we will take that into consideration. Uh, Denise, thank you for joining us. Uh, Rick, please jump in. Yeah, just jumping off the theme of what you're talking about, the living, uh, the memory aspect of this. And I love to re reframe it as a, a as a living memory that is ongoing, iterative, and also how can this group um, go beyond its own boundaries so that it invites more people into that uh, living story movement, memory, etc. Make sense or not? I think so. Does it make sense to other people? Pete, you have your hand up. Um, thanks, Rick. Uh, and I, I've got other topic suggestions too. Uh, first one is uh, where we talk and why we talk. Uh, so we have at least um, this call and the mailing list and Mattermost. Um, I feel like this call is the, the best place, but it's not kind of for everybody. And I wonder if there's a way that we could have more people or, or I wonder if we could do the mailing list better or if we could do Mattermost better. So that's one topic. Um, another topic that's probably fascinating for me, but maybe not for other people, is how close we are with ChatGPT to uh, um, uh, artificial general intelligence. How close is ChatGPT to a person? Which is a big handful topic, um, and 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 interesting and timely. So so agreed. Other. Um, other comments on these topics or suggestions for other things? Maybe uh, something on trust. Um, looking at, like taking George Santos, for example, uh, three Republicans came out and said he needs to resign because uh, people don't trust him. And they said it's already bad enough that you know the level of trust that the American has Americans have in politicians, and this is not helping. So, where do we put our trust? What makes somebody trustworthy? What makes an institution trustworthy? What do we do when our institutions are becoming untrustworthy? Uh, where are the levers for switching that over to a different pathway? Um, and then uh, Gil sent out something a little while ago with um, Malcolm Gladwell talking about. Uh, was the, the mountain climber, this guy from the CIA who ran the Havana uh, Cuba branch. And turns out that um, this is one of the most incredibly well-trained people to detect lies. And he was shined on by uh, this guy who knew everything that was going on for years, never realized that he was being duped. And Gladwell's point is that we need to trust each other because that's how humans are wired. Uh, there will always be people who will violate our trust, but in the long run, it pays to trust. So that's a really interesting topic to me. Um, <clears throat> along the lines of trust, one thing that I haven't dealt with properly, but we had some um, very blunt statements on our mailing list uh, from Daniel Tavisi and Grace about our dynamics and trust and things like that. <laughs> And uh, I haven't gone back in and sort of picked those things up uh, since the year has turned and since the, the holidays. Um, so that's also timely and relevant to us and something we should deal with. Um, so uh, Rick, please. Yeah, I just put it into the, into the comments here and I just put the word ecosystem building on it. I, I know Denise can only be here for half an hour, but we just had a conversation prior to this and she spoke about her work on ecosystems. So um, I thought maybe it might be, uh, um, we could invite Denise, maybe just introduce herself and just very briefly share a little bit about herself. That sounds like a delightful thing. Denise, would you refer that? Thank you. Um, but I need to start with, I'm almost hyperventilating here because a number a number of people here I've um, connected to um, during my interesting ecosystem journey through um, OD Network, Plexus Institute, um, NTL, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And so it's just really, really um, a pleasure um, to reconnect. And I hope that um, I can stay connected. But um, just as a very quick um, intro, um, I had a learning company, and many of you may have known me from uh, Adapt Knowledge. You live and learn. So that's how far back it goes. But um, more importantly, over the last five years, I've been the um, caretaker of Plexus Institute, where I also know a, no a number of you have connected to. And um, But over the last three years, um, I have been working with developing models for human systems dynamics that are based on looking at structural as well as engagement ecosystems. And so um, it's been a little bit of a, of a deep dive into the science, but it's at the intersection of how organizations that are ecosystems, which mean they have humans in them, um, you know, begin to engage and develop and also to integrate the extraordinary speed of information and knowledge um, that is being bombarded at them on a continual basis. And so that is a, I have, I'd love to be able to share that more, more extensively at some point, but I really am here to listen and um, hope that um, I could join you on an ongoing basis, but thank you very much, Rick, for um, telling me about the group, and um, nice to see you all. And it's lovely uh, to have you join us. Do you want to riff for a moment on the ecosystem theme that Rick brought up and just uh, talk about your own sort of angles or work on it? Um, <laughs> oh, it, it, a moment. Um, so ecosystems, um, from our perspective, it, we all live and work in ecosystems, everything and anything that we have, um, you know, a relationship to is an ecosystem, but specifically at this point in time, um, those of you who are familiar with Plexus understand that they originally um, sought to look at complexity um, informed models and constructs in order to help people understand um, how to better engage and how to better find the appropriate next steps um, to what they were doing. And um, from that, it, it appeared that one of the things was that people really needed to understand what complexity was, but also to have just a, a basic foundation for complexity thinking, but then more importantly, start to develop even more robust um, tools and models that addressed how complexity um, was sort of leading to opportunities or to challenges in how we were designing and operating within um, organizations. So um, with a partner of mine who very sadly passed away unexpectedly um, in mid-December, um, he and I had developed something called the Ecosystem Development Framework. Originally, it started with helping early stage and emergent um, organizations or entities within or larger organizations look at how do they start to structure themselves, but more importantly, respond in an ongoing basis to the human dynamics that were um, happening within, within those initiatives or projects. And um, from that, we started to um, link to working within the organizations and doing pretty active research on the human dynamics that um, were occurring. And so it, it's, it's, on the, it's on the edge of being a structural model, but um, for those I've worked with before, you understand that you can't leave the human systems and the engagement component out of it. So, um, the point is, is that when you think of an ecosystem, it's really to understand that the ecosystem is this confluence of both the engagement, the human actions and reactions and experiences, and the structural um, context in which um, they're operating. And I, I apologize, that sounds very wordy, and um, it's, it's hard to explain it specifically, but... Um, if that is helpful, and I'm happy to answer any questions and also to have longer conversations in the future. Thank you. That, that, that's really helpful. Um, and I, in my brain, uh, next to business ecosystems, it says dicey metaphor, because um, I find, uh, and I wrote in the chat, complexity 
ecosystems as meta metaphoric ecosystems and systems thinking are all each of them separately difficult thorny complex issues that are now being applied wholesale and often to <clears throat> what are <clears throat> what we used to call marketplaces or platforms or whatever <clears throat> and I think we have to do that uh that with care because um because some of the ways that ecosystems actually do what they do are pretty different from some of the ways that markets do what they do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as you said, we can't forget the humans because the humans, you know, I, I often say without humans, the world would run pretty smoothly. Um, um, yeah. I, I, and thank you. Um, that is absolutely correct. And that was part of the mission is to really understand um, setting, you know, setting the conditions, if you may, for why you have to understand that we're what you're looking at is an ecosystem and those very specific principles and constructs that come out of complexity science. Um, and I don't mean to say simplified, but to be translated so that you don't need to have multiple PhDs <laughs> in order to do that work. It's not agent based modeling. That's that's the first and foremost part of it. It really is centered on the complex adaptive human ecosystem principles. And so everything that we do, oh my gosh, um, I know Vic as well. So, um, but it, the most important thing is that when you begin this work, you need to recognize that when you use a term, that there is a precedent, there is actual science, there's theory behind it. So saying that something is an ecosystem or that it's emergent or that it's complex um, is, you know, it has very specific meaning. And once you can just understand those meaning, that meaning, then you can start to apply it in a way that makes sense within the context of where you're working. So um, anyway, thank you. Denise, hi. If you could share a, a, a pointer to those principles with us, because um, I, I find that when I hear people talk about ecosystems, I get kind of itchy. As an ecologist, uh, I, 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 my listening is that often people say ecosystem or system without making the distinctions that you're making. So I'd love to see the principles uh, behind that for you. Oh, absolutely. And so I would... Um... Number one, I would be very happy to send out um, some information, that, you know, just to how do you set the conditions for the ecosystem originally. And so if there is a person who I can sort of um, send some information to. Um, I, can, I can put things where everybody else can find them if you want to do it that way. Okay, that would be lovely, Jerry. Thank you. And so if you want to send me the email, um, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and thank the email you. email is in the chat. Perfect. Yep, I um, see. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. And we've gone a, a bit down this path and uh, haven't really settled on <clears throat> on a topic yet for our call. So I want to bounce back up to that and see what's on people's minds because we have uh, several different interesting things on the table. And nobody's enthused about any of them. What else should we talk about? I like the first one. The which? First one. Oh, the where where is the shared memory? Cool. Uh, we could do a quick round robin of uh, with that. See if there's if there's any sort of uh, <clears throat> see what we find there, and then just go move on to the next one because I don't know that that needs to occupy our full hour. I'm just really curious um, whether and how, and I think the weather's important here. People see uh, some kind of shared memory. Um, Pete. Um, having thought about this a lot, as you might guess, um, uh, one of my observations is that we don't really have good, tip, typically, it's really hard for people, people in general to have a good external memory of, of any kind. So Jerry, you're, you're kind of uh, way out on the, um, you know, way out on the curve. Um, uh, I'm, I don't have a, a real good personal memory. I've got like 10 of them or something like that. And none of them is perfect. And I'm always playing around with them. Um, and I'm probably one of the people who works on it harder than most people. Um, maybe I'll buy Nick Milo's uh, uh, vault today for $20 off and magically become a wizard at having a 
uh, external memory. So there's there's one problem, just that we haven't yet developed, you know, the, the tools or the processes to allow people to have a good external memory. Um, another thing is that even when we have, you know, there, there are people with good external memories, not just Jerry. Um, uh, what, what I see is the tech folks, the toolmaker folks looking at those and going, all we have to do is kind of jiggle them around or get the schema right or make it so they can talk together. One's talking JSON, one's talking YAML, one's talking XML. If we just coalesce those, all would be Nirvana. So, um, and I'm simplifying a lot there, obviously. Uh, but um, I'm like, it, it's a because you have to be pretty good at tool making to make make it so that you can have an external memory. The people who have external memories are also tool makers, and tool makers like to make tools more than they like to make um, uh, external memories, as it turns out, mostly. So, so they're attracted to the toolness of the external memory problem. Um, what I think they're not attracted to, or what we haven't, I haven't seen a lot of people talking about this, is if Jerry has an external memory and I have an external memory, I think the only way that we can get them together to talk right now is to actually have Jerry talk about what's in his memory and me talk about what's in my memory. And the conversation of Jerry, Jerry can light up his. Stuart, is that your phone? Um, Sorry. Sorry, mm -hmm. Jerry, you know, if, if Jerry just like, like exposes his external memory so that I can start to hook up mine, I don't really know what he's got in it. I can look at each of the nodes in Jerry's brain, a couple hundred thousand nodes and go, hmm, that's an interesting mm -hmm. node. That's really cool. And I look, it's connected to these other nodes. It's way far different than Jerry actually explaining the context of how these nodes are stitched together and then all the background information that he can remember based on looking at those nodes. So if he tells the story of some part of his brain, um, how humans started making steel, for instance, and I told the story using my external brain, here's, here's what I remember, here's what I can think, here's what I can synthesize using my external brain, we can kind of stitch together a, a combined story of that. But without that kind of human context, human storytelling, I don't, I, I don't see the external brains coming together. So the, so that kind of, that's another, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to think, oh, we could just have a shared brain, um, but I, it's a lot more complicated than that. It's, it's easy to, to imagine that. It's a lot more complicated to actually do it. So I, I think, Jerry, you talked a little bit about Wikipedia. Wikipedia is actually a shared brain. It works really well. Um, uh, it's very stilted. Um, it works because um, uh, Jimmy Wales and the other folks who started it said, um, thou shalt have an encyclopedia and it's gonna look like Encyclopedia Britannica, except that it's gonna be on the cloud instead of on a shelf. So that was a focusing tool so that everybody could fill in the parts of the Encyclopedia Britannica that was missing in the cloud. And then and we made Wikipedia. But Wikipedia is very stilted. It's, um, it's a fact-oriented thing. Um, the way that they decide whether a fact is interesting or not and worthy of being in Wikipedia. If you look at Wikipedia, it's huge, but it's missing like, you know, probably 10 times the amount of things that it could have. Um, uh, the reason for that is because there's a rule that says it's got to be sourced really well. Um, uh, that was a, a devil, a deal with the devil that that Jimmy and the other folks made early on. Um, we're we're going to have a true wiki, or sorry, we're going to have a true encyclopedia for for a certain value of true, and that's the only thing that can fit in 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 the encyclopedia. So differing opinions or different ways of thinking about things or the way Jerry thinks about steel and the way I think about steel and the way Stacy, Stacy thinks about steel, we might have different viewpoints on that. None of that richness and variety would fit into Wikipedia. So it, it, it is another example of essentially how not to do a shared, um, a shared brain. Um, so, uh, so now, not because it was my alternate topic, but because I think it is actually a way forward, 
um, you can, I can kind of imagine um, chat GPT trained on Jerry's wiki and chat GPT trained on Pete's wiki and having chat G, the two jet, chat GPTs talk to each other. Um, so I could say, instead of asking Jerry, Jerry, tell me the story of steel in your, in your brain. If I could ask a bot to do that, then at least we've automated one end of that and maybe we can automate both ends of that and so maybe maybe you know maybe in a year or two years or five years uh we'll just throw a bunch of um uh, uh personal knowledge bases at chatbots and then be able to have them synthesize it i think i i think i would be pretty happy with that i think I think most people would go, yeah, that's not that's not a human shared uh, knowledge base. That's a that's a that's a centaur. That's a a cyborg thing that I I'm very uncomfortable with. I think that is the way most people would think about that um, for at least the first year or two, and then actually everybody's probably going to be using that, you know, instead of Google and Wikipedia. So, thoughts about shared brains. Um, thanks, Pete. Two really quick things before I go to Stuart. Um, one is completely agree about humans in the loop. Um, uh, lots. I think that uh, knowledge management has wasted 40 years of money and effort trying to build big databases of knowledge where what they should have been trying to figure out who do you need to talk to right now um, and just get that done. Uh, and then the second thing is uh, sometimes just getting near the same name or topic and the same URLs, and those are really easy to find and match, is really helpful. Uh, and then we have these shared pages where we take notes uh, sometimes. Those are con some kind of shared memory, but they're long pages mixed of a, a whole bunch of things together. If those were to sort of deconstruct a little bit, they, they would turn into a bit of a shared memory of some sort with shared notes on different pages. And then you have really long history with wikis, which are in fact, once you get away from Wikipedia's constraints of we're an encyclopedia and you're in the namespace of, hey, we're building shared documents. And I think you and I 20 years ago thought that all of us would be collaborating through wikis by now. In fact, using social text, which would be like Facebook. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that, that, that it seems that fates did not did not go that way. Uh, Stuart Ken Gill. Yeah, um, I don't want to sound like too much of a downer, okay? But um, Pete, you just kind of teed this up wonderfully when you talked about uh, a year out or five years out. And um, somehow I feel like we're all in a little bit of denial here in terms of um, the world continue to exist the way it is. Um, I, I listened to a, a, a podcast last night. It was actually Michael Dowd reading a book by William Ophuls, O-P-H-U-L-S, a uh, short book about how um, as a result of climate change, civilization will fall apart. Um, the title of the book was wonderful. It was called The Electrification of the Titanic. <laughs> and it was all about how uh, the idea that we can we can solve everything um, through electrification and getting off of fossil fuel, you know, just it, it is the notion that when you talk about ecosystem, uh, creates uh, larger problems and challenges for for all of us. So, um, the, the, all of that being said, I don't know if it was within here. Uh, in these conversations or someplace else that maybe it was six, eight months ago, where it was the notion of, of some of the people that were really thinking about the future were thinking in terms of um, how can we preserve humanity and technology and the base of knowledge and wisdom we have if all of the major systems uh, uh, fall apart. Um, and uh, that I think is a conversation uh, that's that's worthy uh, of attention. Thanks, Stuart. A, a real quick, thank you, Stuart. I kind of agree. Uh, Massive Wiki is developed is designed kind of for that contingency, actually. Great. Um, yeah, and I don't know if I mentioned that 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 I'm just I, I get the sense that we're all in a little bit of denial. Um, I, as I as I attend, you know, conversations like this, uh, I, I see that so many of us who are living in a certain existence, uh, you know, um, 
the denial seems to re be reflected in the conversations that we continue to have. And yet within myself, there's a bit of ennui and discomfort uh, and inability to engage deeply um, because there are kind of just larger things that seem to be looming on the horizon. I don't want to sound like Chicken Little, but um, somebody, you know, my sense is that somebody needs to say it, and I, you know, for some strange reason, uh, I've been anointed or appointed or, or perturbated or what have you. So here we are. I just want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. today, you, today you are picking up that mantle. Thank you, Stuart. Um, to quote Al Gore, quoting Dire Straits, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Um, and also, it's funny, my path into you, an answer to your question is, if we don't sort out trust and sort out how to share reliable information, we will never manage to handle all these stupid ass issues that are breaking civilization and the planet. So, so I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I agree, Jerry, you know, at the core is our capacity to quote, be human and kind and empathetic and um, with each other. Otherwise, um, you know, things will, will get ugly real fast. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thank you. Ken? Yeah. I think there's a, uh, a couple of things here that need to be teased apart. One is shared brain, other is shared memory. Um, the internet is a shared brain, but the memories are very atomized. And so, you know, when we th when I think of a shared of shared memory, shared memory and service to what? Shared memory and service to survival. Then, what are the things that humans have learned through painful lessons that we need to be that everybody should be aware of? And indigenous people um, know that certain plants kill you. How they find that out? Because people died by eating them, right? So it's like we need we don't seem to have that going on right now. And then there's the fact that there are people who are out there intentionally trying to mock where their memories say, no, that didn't, the, the Armenian genocide didn't happen. The, the Shoah didn't happen. You know, there's these people who deny history, do deny things that have happened. So how do we uh, counter that? What, you know, so to me, it's an enormously large field to explore of what would constitute a useful shared memory for humans, who would be, um, the people who would be curators and what would be the means through which that that memory be accessed. Um, you know, I can go online and find all kinds of stuff that I'm interested in, but other people don't seem to have to have those same interests. So is there a, a common collective interest that maybe we teach it in, used to be taught in school, it was called history and civics, right? Um, we've seemed to have gotten away from that. So how do we come up with um, something that's gonna work cross-culturally, cross-generationally? where people say these are really important pieces of what humans have learned about living in the world that are necessary for our collective survival. And if we could just settle on, you know, a half dozen or a dozen of those and say, if you don't know anything else, this is really worth, worth paying attention to and worth knowing. I don't know how to get there, but it seems like a really important thing to, to consider. Um, Ken, thank you lots for that. Uh, the reason yesterday I wound up in a conversation about how do you end wars or conflicts is that I had just finished watching Argentina in 1985, a really good movie that dramatizes the trials that took former President Videla and a bunch of generals uh, to court uh, for the dirty war. And one of, so, and I visited Argentina in, uh, back way back when, and my buddies, uh, the, the friends I made during my stay, gave me before leaving a copy of the Nunca Mas report, basically in, in somewhere in the stack of books over there, I haven't found it yet, um, is, is this <coughs> report which chronicled and documented all the detention centers, all the, the names of the people uh, killed, uh, the instruments of torture, the confessions, the, 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 everything else was documented and put somewhere so that you could at least pin that somewhere and, and reduce but not eliminate denialism uh, that something even happened. Because it feels to me like, and one of the big benefits of truth and reconciliation commissions is that you get the, the truth in exchange for amnesty. And that truth, if you pin it down and make it visible, is really important because everybody's busy spinning history. And now, uh, now uh, synthetic media is going to be spinning history also and making up facts and hallucinating, uh, you know, uh, all, all kinds of events. So we're kind of in this really 
weird and dangerous era where we have to protect memory in, in some way, which argues also for some kind of shared memory. Uh, Gil. Yeah, uh, gosh, where to start here? Um, um, Ken, I'm reminded of what my friend Ken asks about what do you mean we when you say we? So there's always that. Uh, Stuart, I do not accept your apology. I thank you for bringing that up. Uh, um, so um, Stuart's question is part of the context. We're 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 living in a mess of messes. I've been calling it living between worlds. You know, it's an, an it's an enormous tectonic, you know, historical scale transition that people people are going to look back on this time uh, as a you know an, an unusual transition in human history. I think. Um, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm just feeling itchy this morning because the shared memory thing has got me itchy like the ecosystem thing did. Um, awesome. It's, it's hard enough for human beings to have a conversation together, much less to have a meeting of minds together about anything. Hang on, Chair. Let me, let me just get into, okay. more, let me get into more trouble here before you. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, it's hard enough to have a meeting of minds. It's hard enough to have shared uh, community identity, values, concerns, coordinated action uh, in this space uh, of live human beings, you know, either, you know, little tiles on a Zoom or living in a community together. Why would we imagine that we could do that in tech? Why do we imagine that it would be good to do that in tech? I'm not sure that it would be. Um, I love Wikipedia. Same reason I love Britannica, um, not as like the arbiter of all things, but as a foundation from which to, to, to jump off and think and imagine and have conversations. And, um, you know, Wikipedia, I don't see this as a flaw. It declared it's going to be an encyclopedia. Encyclopedia is a useful kind of technology. You and I can read an article there and have different opinions about it and have different experiences that illuminate it because it's not truth it's you know it's a distillation of some kind of consensus about things we know that consensus is always filtered through values and experience um and that's where the live discussion happens so um we have shared memory through a culture through common experience i mean you know to ken's example uh you know uh, uh Indigenous people in the place we call Australia have shared memory going back tens of thousands of years. Remarkable. Uh, we have also played the game of telephone. And we've seen, you know, studies about witnesses. And we've seen the gorilla and basketball tape. And we know that human memory has its own constraints and its own drift. So I'm not clear what the aspiration, back to the original question, I'm not clear what the aspiration for shared memory is. And I think it needs a bit more, um, needs some more work on, you know, on, on what we mean by that. Uh, and why do we want that? What, and maybe it's not even why do we want that? It's like, what do we want that we think shared memory helps us get to or that helps support? So there's a bunch of questions underneath the question, Jerry. That's why I like the question. Um, thank you. And I'm right now trying to book a final episode of season one of the Tools for Thinking podcast with uh, Ida Josefina of SANE in Finland and Doug Rushkoff. Mm -hmm. And Doug, when approached and sort of uh, asked about the topic and all, he's like, so the topic we're winding up with is why Tools for Thinking? Mm -hmm. He's like, is this, is this ever going to work? Why bother? uh has this ever worked how does this work you know something like that and i'm probably projecting a little too much onto him here but it's a really good question i mean the idea is this could be just a futile effort <clears throat> a because information is really complicated opinions are really complicated and you get three of those in a room and we are often running into impenetrable territory really really quickly um but on the other hand and the question i was going to ask you as you were talking was um, have you found in your experiences having conversations with other humans that having a physical artifact like a post-it on the wall or a series of post-its on the wall that represent ideas or concepts or facts or whatever, uh, or let's pretend on a computer, was that helpful to the conversation? And might some persistence of what we agreed on in some space, paper or informational, be helpful? And I think, yes, my, my experience, my personal experience is... OMG, having some kind of outboard 
memory on post-its or on, on, on devices is incredibly helpful, but not often enough. And as Pete said way at the start, it's rare. Like most people aren't inclined to share their notes. Most people don't take great notes. Uh, never mind other sorts of forms of, of all this kind of thing. So it, it is absolutely thorny and messy. And I'm trying to figure out a simple way to explain it and cut through it. So clearly not that close to it. Yeah. Uh, um, to, your, to, your, to your question, do I value tools for thinking? Absolutely. I love tools for thinking. I geek out on not quite as much as you do. And by the way, please put a link to the podcast in the chat to refresh us on that. Um, um, you know, this interpenetrates with the question of overload. Uh, I can't even keep track of my own memory. My wetware memory, my externalized, my tech memory, my paper memory, I'm a wash in paper. I just this week discovered stuff that I wrote 15 years ago I thought was really a jewel and I want to do something with, which is what I thought then and didn't. It got lost in the array. So it's not just memory, it's access. It's filtered, relevant, you know, uh, um, constantly evolving, relevant access. Uh, because, you know, we see it here, you know, we're having a conversation, things pop up in the chat, you run down a trail you hadn't even imagined running down. There's, um, maybe it's not shared memory, maybe it's about, maybe we're talking about mind, you know, uh, and we've, we've gradually learned that it's not about brain, it's about mind. Brain is, you know, I don't live in this, in this bunch of, 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 of tissue inside my skull case. I live in a body that's experiencing, you know, that's, that's experiencing not just neurologically, but hormonally and kinesthetically and proprioceptively in other ways. And in action, interaction with you all, uh, there's something here that is, that is beyond, that is beyond each of us, that is sort of all of us. The thinking is happening together. The thinking is not happening in here. It's happening here. Uh, and in the associations of all the stuff that we live with. So there's the, you know, shared maybe is the word for it. Maybe it's, maybe shared as a way of an individualized perception of something that is more real than each of us. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm riffing wildly here. I don't know, you know if this is making sense, but I think the, the shared memory question is, I think it's the wrong question. I think it's too narrow a question. I think it, back to what we were talking about before, about the metaphors of systems and ecosystems and the dangers of metaphors. We've just walked into a dangerous metaphor. It's rich, it's juicy, it's fascinating. And let's recognize that it's just a name that we're giving to something that we don't know how to name. Uh, Gil, thank you. And you're you're cracking open a bunch of kind of philosophical questions that really matter to the issue at hand. Um, a shared memory is, for me, the simplest two words I can use when I could say collective intelligence, collaborative sense making, hive mind, and uh, you know half dozen other terms that are in the same neighborhood but don't only mean the same thing. The mind brain duality and the mind or memory thing is really deep and complicated, and don't know that we want to crack open that Pandora's box right here. But it but it's but it's germane. And then back to what Pete said earlier. It really all comes down to humans getting together and, and figuring out things out together in some way. So that just complexifies everything. Let's say it's one more thing, then I'll yield. Yeah, go ahead. Um, in a conference a couple of years ago with uh, with Fernando Flores, somebody was int introducing, he was somebody was starting to say something, saying, I think that. And Fernando, in his classic way, just interrupted, said, you're not thinking. And the person said, what? You know, it's like the reaction is, how can you say such a weird thing to me? He said, you're not thinking. Thinking is something happening to you. And I found that enormously provocative. And I've chewed on that a lot since then. Um, you know, we, we here, I, I was doing it a moment ago. I was speaking without any idea of what I was about to say. The words just came out of my mouth from me from somewhere. Uh, but it's not just me from somewhere. It's me in this conversation, interaction with all of you on top of my lived experience of the last XDX years. It's a weird thing that happens, this thing that we call thinking. So that's part of this mess, too. You Absolutely. Mr. Breitbart. Yeah, so I'm going to pick up with where you're leaving off. Um. So all the action is in the present moment. And thinking is one dimension of being. And if, if 
the telescope were turned around and instead of being focused on all the things external to us were turned around and focused on how I'm doing me, how you're doing you. Um, what are the internal, innate, intrinsic capacities that as human beings based on culture and imprinting and education and everything else, um, we've had trained out of us on an awareness level, on a consciousness level, on an orientation level. My experience, when you turn the telescope around and put an, a lot of time and attention into how am I doing me? How am I receiving and experiencing others? And how can my orientation and, and awareness be expanded um, in service to having a better handle on dynamics and flows and why what is manifesting in reality is manifesting the way it's manifesting. And to a certain extent, you know, my experience, you know, Stuart, your thing about, you know, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're about to run out of food. We're about to, you know, have social unrest. We're about to have this whole show collapse on itself and we're fiddling on the deck, right? And um, I, I believe um, how we're doing us and how we might do us differently in relation to and response to the reality we're seeing around us uh, is as germane a question in saving ourselves or not. As all of the history, experience, and learning, which somehow, notwithstanding it being there, doesn't seem to affect what, as a species, we're doing. Actually, in fact, proactively doing. And um, all of the conversation about aggregative collective anything and, and the same tickle around ecosystem as a metaphor, all of those things are aggregative, but in a certain way, they're creating distance and, and going further away from the focus on how am I doing me? How is this group doing this group collectively? And how do we change that or affect that or catalyze a shift in that? And so a lot of this intellectual and abstract and aggregative and, um, and, and technologically exponentially enhanced capacity to sort of um, distance, separate and objectify our reality is responsible for why we're on the edge of extinction. And it's not a negation of that or a devaluation of that or a judgment of that. I really want, to, I want everybody to understand I'm not like anti anything, but it's a balancing. And there are just pieces of the balance system um, that are where the action is, where people actually um, source from moment to moment to moment to moment that's never part of the conversation. And with that, I'm complete, just to throw something into the mix. Um, thanks, Doug. 
as as you were talking, I was meditating a bit on my mo, my methods of being present, and and the thing Pete and I do a lot on these calls, which we've talked about before, which is we're screwing around, looking things up, adding things, curating gardening. And there's a piece of that activity that takes us out of being present, which we're trying to cure with more presence on the check-in calls, et cetera. But, but there's a piece of that that's very present in the moment. And for me, that's very aggregative, accumulative, and gets better over time. Like things, pieces of the puzzle snap into place. And another piece of what I was thinking was, if I'm note-taking or externalizing things for myself, am I separating them from me or am I inspecting them more closely? And Naomi posted in the chat, uh, there's a couple articles and a really great thread by Michelle Huang uh, that you know she fed her, her childhood journals, which is somebody writing things down in the very present. Like journaling is, is I think, a very present exercise. And feeding them into chat GPT and then having a conversation with her younger self, that sounds incredibly fruitful to me. And, and seeing insights about your earlier self and how you've changed feels like the kind of internal growth that I think you're looking for us to have, everyone to get, and so forth. So I love that. And and I'm I'm sort of trying to sort those things out together because, because they're a little confusing and, and complicated. Don't know if you want to step back into that. I um I I appreciate and and recognize um there's a living part in that for you in your engagement flow sort of where you experience pull what you're drawn to and And I think that's part of lived experience for Jerry. And the key is every single person has a different mosaic. <laughs> like there are no two alike. And um, until we start uh, replicating exactly, but still that's in the future. There you go. So, and, and, um, the essential in it is honoring that, my honoring that in you. So nothing that I'm saying is about in negation or opposition or polarization to that. It's and. It's not an or, it's an and. Um, and in, the, in some of the facets and and dimensions of living being non-intellectual me mental body. Um, there are these other domains where there are commonalities that are universal to every human. And connecting with those, reawakening those, is where the human dimension of what I see in you that I see in me comes alive. The recognition and, and resonance points that have two people that are at each other's throats in a political frame, right? In the face of seeing something happen in front of them, that's a disaster they can save somebody becoming one. And that phenomenology of people transcending their individual stuff and attachments and preferences and, and centers of, of, of focus, transcending that in service to with others without any intervening like governance questions, organizational questions, constructive, you know, intellectual, abstract, structural, you know, none of that stuff, people just act together. Um, that's the, like, what's the sauce in that? And how do we catalyze that globally for people to actually, um, reflect in their behavior, the consciousness that all of us, that Stuart is, is referencing, which is like, shit, guys, we're going over a cliff. Like next year, the supermarkets are going to be empty. 
Like it's not going to be there to buy. It's not even going to be an inflation question. It's going to be like, where do I buy food? Um, so there are pieces and dimensions that I think um, we need to elevate in some way that we need to bring into the conversation and the frame as a balance and dimension of um, affecting an, uh, an orientational and, and consciousness level shift in awareness and resonance and alignment across our species um, that factors on a visceral level, on a physical level, on a spiritual level, on an energetic level. And those are all those invisible intangible domains that we've had beat out of us, like we've forgotten <laughs> um, that indigenous people haven't. Like they're feeling everything. So. Thanks, Doc. Um, Rick Ben Stacy. And uh, Rick, if you want to pause for a little bit before starting, we can sort of process a little bit and then catch up with you. You go ahead, you take us back in, but I think a little pause and that would be great. Actually, I'm going to uh, just ask Gil a question. I, I put it, it was a typo, it's in the chat actually. And it's how might we use our shared memories to build a living, an ongoing, well, not a, but story movements to develop flourishing ecosystems of trust, integrity, and transparent accountability. So re, re going back to some of the themes that have been evolved, but I don't know if Gil, you'd like to respond to that question? I, I think I responded already and said plus one. Well, I thought you might be able to elaborate on that plus one. No. What? Um, no, I think that's what that's the human enterprise, isn't it? That's what we do. Yeah. That's what we've always done. Maybe. Uh, Rick, you're muted. Well, let me reframe the question. How can we do better? Hmm. I'll open that out to anybody. I don't feel like I need to say anything other than ask the question. I like the question a lot. Perfect. <laughs> I wanted to uh, throw in the name Julia Galif. She's the co-founder of the Center for Applied Rationality. And she uses a metaphor, um, soldiers and scouts. And what I wanted to say is that sometimes I find there are too many soldiers and they wind up killing the scouts. Soldiers are the ones that um, can't take in the information that goes against what they already think so they kill it um jerry brought up daniel and grace earlier and i know from communicating with both of them that sort of ties into and i'm not i'm not holding this group i'm not saying this group does that but what i'm saying is in conversations about trust and safety and memory and all those things I think we look for that, we want that scout mentality. Now, it's not likely that we're gonna be able to train every soldier how to be a scout, but I think it's really important that at the top of the pyramid or, or at the gates to information, we have more scouts than soldiers. Um, you know, it's, I always think about how John Stewart was the most trusted man in America. And he was able to talk to Bill Riley. You know, they had conversations. He was trusted by everyone. And I think he's a good example of this, um, you know, scout mindset. You know, and I recently I was listening to him talk to a group of people about COVID. And we all know what a dicey topic that was. But I mean, it was a great conversation. And in general, what I think the problem is, is that many people, shut down total you know shut you know they close the gates to all information 
because they find one thing and where they're finding that one thing, there's no, I'm, I'm not saying this well. We have to be a little bit more open to siphoning out what we're not 100% sure of instead of saying it's totally wrong. We have to find first what we agree with and that starting point and work from there. That's what I love about these conversations because we get to hear what's coming from each person. And let's face it, the per I mean, at least for me, who the person is that's giving me the information does have a certain amount of weight as to how much I trust it. So I'm complete. Thank you, Stacey. Where does that put us? Who would like to step in and take us in a different direction or add a spin or? Stuart. Yeah, I, it's funny. I, I had this on my desk and I, and, I, and I just threw it out. And I think that this is where we're heading and, and, and maybe there's nothing more to say about it, but it's a great quote from the novelist and naturalist, uh, Peter Matheson. Um, when we are mired in the relative world, never lifting our gaze to the mystery, our life is stunted incomplete. We are filled with yearning for that paradise that is lost when as young children, we replace it with words and ideas and abstractions, such as merit, past, present, future, our direct spontaneous experience of the thing itself in the beauty and precision, precision of this present moment. And in this present moment is where we feel the connection and the juice and uh, need I say the love of each other that ties us together as human beings. And um, given the, the, the kind of precipices that we're all standing on right now, you know, regardless of whether you believe there's gonna be some utopian future or you believe that it's gonna be a dystopian future, um, in the present moment, what we need is each other and the moment of connection um, between us and, and the love that might flow and emanate between us. I mean, I was just thinking about that after, you know, maybe spending a year or so uh, on these calls. There's something that here that everybody brings to the party. Everybody brings something to this party, whatever this party is. All right but we keep coming back and keep showing up and keep being drawn together. And that's, I think the mystery that Peter Matheson is, 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 is pointing to beyond those abstractions, the connection is kind of uh, where the, the, the juice of life is. Stuart, thank you. Pete, super swift on the quote find. That was the stuff that was. Um, Klaus, off to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back to chat GPT because I'm actually um, really up on, on what is being done with this. Uh, I'm putting a conversation into the chat here, but I watched another one, which I lost. I can't find it, but the guy, uh, the, the, the presenter was using chat GPT to take a topic and then start by developing an index. And in the index, the chat GPT laid out um, uh, uh, connections and relationships that uh, you wouldn't have thought of automatically. And then he went into the individual index items and asked for the next level of detail down. And it was stunning, you know, how um, how this widens the, the conversation instantly. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, by by asking intelligent questions, you can claim authorship, right? Because you you uh, you're doing research, and the ChatGPT is your research tool, um, and you develop you know a, a, a brilliant paper in 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 a very short per period of time. And what that does is it it um, it creates an understanding of system inadvertently, right? Because people who don't even think in terms of systems simply by exploring a topic and then asking the chat GPT 
uh, uh, questions that have structure to it. You know? So you go through this process of exploring the topic. Um, you can get, you get, you get, uh, you become aware of, oh, I didn't think this was connected, you know, or I didn't you know, uh, uh, understand that this was part of this topic. So I, I think this will this will revolutionize uh, the way we think and, and the way we treat information. <laughs> and I think we're not yet uh, prepared you know, for for what this uh, really will do to to uh, to the human mind and to our understanding, if used as a tool. You know, if used to augment ourselves, our our mind, our exploration, this is going to be amazing. The trouble, of course, is, and uh, I was watching a, a, a conversation with Schmidt, you know, the uh, CEO from uh, Microsoft, um, with someone, with some other guru there, and Schmidt was talking about, you have to understand Anytime something like this gets introduced, it will be misused. It's automatic. You have to assume that somebody will mess with it and, and, and abuse it. And the AI, the chat GPT, cannot distinguish between right and wrong. So if you feed it bad information, it will use that information as if it was real. It just it, it doesn't have any safeguards in this regard. The safeguards have to be in the in the in the way that the algorithms are really constructed and protected. So someone somewhere is going to you know, uh, mess that up. So that's that's the the downside of it. You no, know? but uh, um, I think I think and then then one the other thing that Schmidt was saying that really struck me is the he he, he was making an appeal to software developers and uh, to people in uh, decision making positions in whether Google and and. Uh, Facebook and Twitter and anywhere uh, to support democracy. Um, he was saying, when I look around the world today and I see what is happening in China, in Russia, in other in, in the Middle East, where um, people are messing with information, messing with democratic institutions, I much rather stick with democracy as imperfect as it may be, and I think we have a moral obligation to to support that. So, so yeah, I, I think this will be a profound year. I think twenty twenty this this is what what is happening right now in the sphere of thought and and uh, uh, and enabling uh, knowing, you know, to to and sense making with such profound tools. I think it will blow us away. I hope so because we are. Uh, at the precipice of uh, of a lot of uh, things that we don't want to see happening. From your lips to God's ears, Klaus, as they say. Um, I'm going to take two minutes just to riff on something that I've said a couple of times, I think, before in these calls, but just in case, because I think it's useful, which is about computer creativity in the with the intention of tweaking the conversation a little toward Pete's topic of AGI and, and all of that. Uh, and the, the 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 moment the light bulb really went on for me about computer creativity was Alpha Zero. Uh, Google's DeepMinds group uh, built a Go playing program called AlphaGo, which it trained using historic games of Go between experts. And there, Go was an ancient game, so there were a lot of games. And that game managed to beat Lee Sedol, the world's best Go expert. Now. Uh, chess programs have been beating chess masters for some time. So it's like, but Go is a more complicated game. So that was kind of interesting. But then what they did was <clears throat> they took a, a version of the same software, but didn't train it on historic games of Go. They trained it only on the rules of Go, which are very simple. You can put stones on a 19 by 19 grid. There's a way that you take, that you take territory. That's it. And then you count up uh, how much territory you've won. And Alpha Zero then uh, beats beats the, all the human experts, beats AlphaGo, and goes into sort of unknown territory. There's a lovely chart of, of the curve still going up above. And that piece over what the sort of the limits of what we knew before is, is for, to my mind only, uh, computer creativity. And it's creativity in part because the system didn't have preconceptions about what to do, didn't have the frames of historic experience and what we always do in this situation and all of that, all of the things we do. And so, and so partly I was about to say that 
chat GPT or things like that might in fact be free of human preconceptions. But wait a minute, we've trained these things on all of the human vagaries of the written body of work we have out there. And a piece of this conversation was about when we externalize things and leave them as writings, what is the effect on society? So, so these engines, these large language models have absorbed and not recorded verbatim, but have absorbed the patterns of what makes sense as words in the world and can then come back in and change uh, a science fiction plot from being steampunk to being solar punk, for example, like, like that as a concept. And I started my career in tech uh, explaining neural networks to people. And one of the ways I would explain it to people is like a neural network could be really good at figuring out what mapleness is in a leaf. Like it could look at a bunch of leaves and go, oh, these are probably maple leaves and these are probably not. You do not want a neural network doing your accounting. Like it's not designed for that, not good for that. Use something else that actually understands like integers uh, and maths. Uh, so, so we're in this really interesting unexplored territory now where these, li these large language models are available. They're absorbing what civilization has written. Now they're absorbing what they're creating. And we've had a little bit of this conversation before about is this the end of sort of the, the easily accessible knowledge space because now we're polluting the knowledge space and we're sort of uh, uh, adding to the indexes like all the crap that we're generating randomly that's hallucinated and not actually real and what's that going to do? Um, and just, I just wanted to put that in the room and maybe with that, pass it to Pete, if you want to head toward the topic you have. We don't have a bunch of time, but we got enough time to I, um, take an interesting I, swing. I, uh, it, it's interesting that, uh, you, that creativity is a thing that you would grab onto for AGI. Um, it's one path in, I, I and, oh, and the other thing is really interesting to me. I, I play around more with uh, stable diffusion and image generator than, um, than chat GPT. Um, uh, so I can talk a little bit more about creativity in, in AI image generation. And uh, where I've kind of ended up, it's funny, image generation has a, has a um, reputation now that, oh, the way that you use an image generator is you imagine a scene and then you want it uh, painted by Borlas Vallejo uh, or mix Boris Vallejo with Picasso. And, and that's the kind of thing that you ask uh, an image generator for. And it, it happens a lot. Um, uh, I have done, I've gone a different way. Um, I accidentally typed three words into stable diffusion and, you know, I wonder what happens if I just give it three words, a very underspecified thing, right? And it wasn't actually even asking for a thing. It was just kind of, uh, you know, evoke something uh, in response to these three words. And sometimes you get really boring, trite stuff, but some combinations of words, you get really creative stuff. Um, and what's happening, creative, um, whenever we get into talking about human intelligence and machine intelligence, um, I hear our friend Mark Carranza in my head. Uh, Mark Carranza is uh, extremely skeptical of, of uh, machines doing anything like thinking or knowing or remembering or being creative. So um, maybe I'm talking about something different uh, than human creativity, but um, I've been startled um, by the image generating things, uh, dreaming essentially. What, what I'm doing is I'm underspecifying what to draw. And so it comes up with something that fits what I asked, but is, you know, kind of random. And sometimes uh, for the same three words, it will come up with a, a misty forest scene or um, uh, a weird kind of wall uh, with a, a portal through it, uh, looking off to uh, a better world or something like that. Um, uh, so uh, another thing that I've, I've seen happen with stable diffusion is um, when I specify a longer thing and I'm actually trying to get it to, to like think in a direction, um, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time, I've got a, a kind of a um, avocational interest in images and photography and things like that. Um, I've got a pretty good eye for photography and composition and things like that. So, um, so it's really interesting to me that it can, 
it's, it's always kind of hallucinating, right? But it'll hallucinate scenes that I'm pretty sure like people never thought of. Um, and it will do it with um, a lot of, because stable diffusion knows what good images look like. And I always ask it for good images rather than bad ones. Um, uh, it, it can kind of remember an image out of the billions of images it's seen. And, and by remember, I mean synthesize. It, it, um, uh, it, you know, it, it, it evokes um, a, a scene out of, you know, its huge memory that is different than I think anybody else would have ever seen. And so part of the fun that I have with stable diffusion is it, it feels like exploring a new land to me because I'm always getting it to make things that people haven't seen before. And I, and it frustrates the heck out of me um, knowing that I can't run around and, you know, post on Twitter and say, look at this thing that, <clears throat> you know, only I've ever seen and got imagined by a machine. So um, creativity is an interesting thing. And it's interesting that we thought hum uh, that computers wouldn't be creative. They're, they're, they're really good at being creative, I think. Um, if you drive them the right way, Jerry, you kind of said it, you know, you wouldn't use a neural network for doing your counting, but you would use a neural network for dreaming and machines dream really well now. Um, if you if you kind of set them up right and use them the right way. Um, the other things that I are more I'm more interested in for AGI now are uh, theories of mind and um, in a conversation, what is the other person thinking? And how might I help them think a better way or think differently? How is their thinking making my thinking different? Um, I, so, so just to say it real quick, I think um, AGI is, is about 20 times to 100 times more complicated than ChatGPT. Um, but I think that's not a very big number. Um, and uh, you know, kind of just guessing, that sounds like a couple of years in, um, in Silicon Valley tech time. Um, so, um, and, I, and I think the way forward is you know, we, we haven't really hit emotion and we haven't really hit um, uh, like how other people are feeling. I think that's the, that's the next big step that AI, AIs will, will be taking towards shepherded by humans, uh, hopefully good humans rather than bad humans. Again, from your lips to God's ears. Um, Pete, thank you. That was, that was awesome. Uh, one thing you triggered at the very end, which I'll put in and then we'll see what everybody else wants to talk about. Um, in the field of AI and robotics and all that, there's, um, I, I, I'm going to be very binary about this. There's kind of two approaches. One is emulating humans as the goal. And the other one is, hey, let's just make this the best thing it could possibly be. Um, and I've always been troubled by the emulating humans route. It's like, why would you want an Android that stands and looks that has the physical aspects of a human when that's like a cranky way to move around in the world? Spiders like can crawl up walls. They have like great territory. They can like manage territory much better. They have many more points of contact. Snakes can get around, et cetera, et cetera. Like, why are we trying to emulate humans? And then with AGI, it's like, until it passes the Turing test and reasons exactly like a human, I won't be happy. I'm like, you know what? In certain areas, computers are way outperforming humans already. If we manage to patch this together into something that, that's spectacularly different and better, we've generated some form of intelligence that is uh, that. And then I think a, one of the little things that sort of crawls in there is uh, common sense. Uh, sorry, I'm putting something in. So I remember it uh, is common sense. Like like does the does the system know enough to come in out of the rain, sort of things. And and common sense is hard. Uh, reasoning, reasoning like a five-year-old is actually difficult because there's some things that are hard to model that way. And then the last thing I'll add is um, long ago, Rodney Brooks wrote a book about robotics in which he said, hey, the people in robotics are really working hard. They're busy trying to get a robot to see a scene. Then they're trying to identify there's a chair, there's a rug, there's a pillow. And then they're trying to calculate a trajectory through the room and make their way through. And computers were nowhere near powerful enough to do that. And he took a couple of very simple algorithms and basically said, hey, I'm going to make a little worm-like thing or centipede-like thing that knows enough to bump and turn. And it, it, it basically senses and responds as it goes. And these robots he made, their behaviors were very animalistic, very naturalistic. 
he was getting really, really great behavior with very little processing power by taking a completely different approach to it. And when I look at uh, how cars are trying to do autonomous driving, they're trying to identify the scene, map everything, make sure that there's no child or bicycle running across, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know, there's, there may be other ways to get to this AGI kind of thing. Um, sorry, long riff, Pete. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to relate a, a quick odd thing. Um, uh, so I spent a lot of time um, asking stable diffusion to to imagine something based on three words, right? And so it, it dreams a lot. And I'm watching it dream a lot. And um, I've gotten, I, I guess, for better or for worse, not that this was my intent, but I've trained myself to see how it how it thinks of patterns, right? Where it where it puts stuff in the composition and and the larger scale things and the smaller scale things um, to make a forest scene, for instance, or uh, to make a landscape with hills or something like that. And it'll it'll do a forest scene or a landscape with hills or 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 interesting cathedral things by itself on the three words that have nothing to do with forests or hills or cathedrals. Um, but I have this weird, I, and I, I'm not sure that I like it. Um, I have this weird thing now when I'm out in nature, walking down the street, looking at, at shrubs in my suburban, I have a suburban kind of and uh, partly de desert um, you know, place where I can go walking every day. Um, I look at trees and I look at shrubs and stuff like that, and I can kind of see the algorithm that nature used to, to make the self-replicating fractal thing happen much more than I used to. Um, and I think what I'm seeing is I'm recognizing the, you know, the, the uh, self-replicating, you know, fractal patterns um, that nature uses. And it's got different ones, but it kind of uses them in the same way. And I think uh, stable diffusion is kind of doing something similar. And I'm, you know, it's trained me, watching it has trained me to see it in nature more. It's kind of, kind of an odd thing. I don't know if it's good or bad. I'm going to recommend uh, everyone watch this video after we hang up. It's Jonathan Colton's song Mandelbrot set, which is pretty funny, I think, um, about Benoit Mandelbrot and what he invented. And it's it's like a pan to to what Pete was just saying in some sense. Um, any closing thoughts? We're near the end of our, our usual 90 minutes. Um, Anyone else on AGI? Uh, so round uh, voting with voting with your hands. Raise your hand if you think in the next decade. So we are in 2023, the beginning of 2023, 2033. Will we have what we consider to be AGI available? Like like right now we have Chat GPT available. We don't think it it clears the hurdle. Will there be some system in 10 years that seems to clear the hurdle? Raise your hand if you think yes. I, I have a I have a problem with that question, which is that whenever computers get better at something, we say, "Well, that's not." We move the goalposts. Human level intelligence. We move the goalposts. So, um, you know, so it's they're already better at most things than humans. Uh, in 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 narrow <clears throat> in narrow areas, they're like kicking ass. But the, the, the areas are getting bigger, you know, yes. well, an AI, you know, a, a robot couldn't paint, a, a robot couldn't, you know, remember something, a robot couldn't tell me a story, a robot couldn't translate languages, a robot, you know, it's like, personally, I'm running out of things that robots can't do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, how, far, how far can you move the goalposts? Before so they're so my, the my answer is we're going to have human level, my answer, <clears throat> and it, I may be wrong, my answer is we'll have human level intelligence in the next couple of years, and we will continue to, to, to deny it probably for the next 10 years. Okay. Thinking of um, Star Trek Next Generation and Data, who, you know, Matter Data, he looked human, although he had, you know, strange eyes and white skin, and he acted very human, but and he was amazingly technically technically proficient at playing his violin, but he didn't have soul. And so maybe that's part of the thing is, you know, we can get that level of intelligence, but we ain't going to get the soul. I've never thought of data as a modern version of Pinocchio before, but you just did that. <laughs> um, Klaus, then Gil, then Stuart. 
Yeah, there is another phenomenon that, that uh, is really coming out, and Yuval Harari actually pointed that out. He's saying that there is a split uh, in humanity at species level, and that's caused by information. So, for example, my, my daughter has three little girls, and the way that they are being stimulated is incredible. Uh, and there is now there there is now a, there are AI tools directed at children, so children don't learn anymore the way we traditionally understand. They learn to use tools, uh, data tools. You know uh, uh, how to find information, how to ask questions in ways that uh, they they get answers <laughs> automatically routed to them. Now you compare that to the couple million children in the United States who live in the street or the you know 40 million people in the United States who are food insecure you know children growing up traumatized by the lack of food have zero access to the internet have zero access to any form of training and education during their formative years um, when they when their brain develops so you will have uh you will have a split where you have people who can't even talk to each other anymore you know, because the 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 brain as it evolves and develops um, will go into completely different directions. I mean, it's like Neanderthal and and uh, uh, Homo sapien. Yeah. Thank you, Gil. Yeah, my question is uh, is who owns stuff? Who owns what? Um, and Hans posted, "Who owns the future?" And I think that's an enormously important question here. We already see it in the IP discussions around Chat Chat GPT. Um, and what some people see as the appropriation of work creators and artists uh, into this shared matrix, which is great. Um, as a user, it's great for me. As a creator, maybe it's not so great for me. Um, and, um, you know, back to the ecosystem metaphors at the beginning of the call, uh, we, are, we are in a world of such lopsided trophic web structure. Uh, you know, what, what, what's the latest number? Like three Americans own as much as half of the rest of us. Uh, so these systems are enormously unstable, becoming more so. People have talked about techno feudalism. Um, yeah, you know that wasn't the antidote to late capitalism that I was looking for, but it may be where we're headed. So that that whole set of questions uh, in here um, seems to be a very important one. And Jane just passing by, hearing part of the conversation, offers that intelligence is not what makes us human. Love that. Um, <clears throat> briefly, I will add to the question who owns the future. I'm troubled by the whole notion of ownership. And I think we are, as a Western culture, way too obsessed with ownership. And I have a thought in my brain, ownership versus stewardship. Uh, because if we actually yeah. may, if we act as good adult, as good ancestors, we wouldn't be owning and sequestering and separating things. We would actually be taking care of things uh, so that we might all benefit from them. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, but we're in, we're in a world of capitalism where ownership is the heart of everything. But that, uh, might be the, that might be the lever that pries the lid off capitalism, by the way. Let me, but let me just add one other thing to that. As, 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 uh, one of the things I've been learning um, <clears throat> in the past few years is how much capitalism is rooted in violence. Um, uh, uh, Ernest Becker's book, the, um, the Something of Cotton, The Empire of Cotton. Uh, mm. The evolution of you know the last several hundred years of capitalism is founded in war capitalism and physical at, at gunpoint seizure of resources. If you look if you look at the enclosure acts uh, in England, in what was that, 16th century, 17th century, uh, at at bayonet point, uh, people were forced off their land into the factories. Uh, and so, talking about ownership uh, takes us into conversations about power, and not just aspiration, but really you know the real power dynamics that we live in in the world today. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, ownership to stewardship, yes, uh, commons, yes, but how do we get from here to there? Big question. And the tools that we are fascinated by, <clears throat> how to say it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn to be very careful about predicting, so I don't know where it goes, but there, it looks like they have tendencies to take us further down the rat hole and tendencies to take us out into the new world, and they're both there, right? Thank you for reminding me that capitalism is rooted in violence. I had kind of missed that in some weird way. And I just went and like quickly found a bunch of different like, whoa, I need to weave this together. It's important. And how did I forget that? Um, Stuart. 
Yeah. And so Ken, Ken has something for us on the way out. Go ahead. Sir. Yeah. So one of the places I've been noodling with is um, <clears throat> stepping out of the matrix. And, and the idea of ownership is just so much a part of, um, of the matrix. Um, you know, uh, think about uh, Manhattan being bought for $26 from Native Americans because it, the indigenous wisdom, wow, <laughs> they're going to give us something from, um, uh, from this nothing. And, and, and also this notion of uh, whether or not AI can um, be as intelligent as human beings. Uh, God, I hope that that's not the aspiration because we certainly need a lot more uh, intelligence slash we need wisdom because our intelligence has gotten into this incredible, has gotten us to this place of morass. And, and, and maybe um, there's enough information, intelligence and, and wisdom to uh, get us out of the morass or you know, back to Einstein. The thinking that God is here is not going to get us there. Thank you, Stuart. Um, we are at time. Ken, uh, Gil, did you have a last word? I have a I have a before Ken's last word. Just a reminder that when we talk about humans, uh, we're we're not all the same, right? Um, uh, and whether it's men and women or Eastern or Western or advanced or indigenous, you know, industrial or indigenous, da, 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 there are many, many different ways we are. Uh, and so the notion of getting something that is human-like is maybe another dangerous question. Thank you. Uh, that entirely folds right into the decision-making processes of people trying to emulate humans. Absolutely. Yeah. Ken. Mr. Homer. So um, this is from the opening to Chesapeake by James Michener. This is how everything begins. The ultimate source of the Susquehanna River was a kind of meadow in which nothing happened. No cattle, no mysteriously gushing water, merely the slow accumulation of moisture from many unseen, un unimportant sources. The gathering of dew, so to speak, the beginning the unspectacular congregation of small things, the origin of purpose. And where the moisture stood, sharp rays of bright sunlight were reflected back until the whole area seemed golden and hallowed, as if here life itself were beginning. This is how everything begins, the mountains, the oceans, life itself, a slow accumulation, the gathering together of meaning. I thought that'd be a nice way to start the year. Love that. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, Ciao, y'all. <clears throat> thank you for another lovely call. Thank you all. Yeah. These are gifts we give each other. Amen. Indeed. And Denise just posted some real good to the chat. Always a good idea. Yeah, Always Denise. room for real cup. <laughs> Denise, I, you really, like you said, you had to. Thanks for staying. Yeah. Adios. Thank you. I have um, monitoring something on another screen. Got to go. But um, they probably feel highly, <laughs> highly ignored. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I hope to join you again if you'll have me. Thank Come you. Come back, Denise. Any, anytime. Nice to see you, Ken. <clears throat> really. It's just, ah, anyway. And you, Stuart, too. Okay. Ciao. You too. Uh, ciao. <laughs> ciao, everyone. <laughs>